supporting so people will know that they are. Mm -hmm. Have my little companion here. Oh, that's pretty cute. <laughs> Welcome, Hobiovan. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hey. Hello, Lily. Um, can I you hear me? You were able to come. Thank you. I'm going to take this call because it aids somebody who wants to participate. All right. What is uh, the name of the cat, Michelle? She's new. Her name's Maggie. We just Maggie. adopted her. But <laughs> um, she hates my other cat. Oh, we have, we have them separated. Good times. Yeah, we're, we're working on socializing them. So it's been a little bit interesting. Do you I have any, any pets yourself? I wish. No, I don't. Mm -hmm. I love dogs more than cats. My yeah. wife does love cats. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Like I've had a, I haven't had positive experiences with cats. Like the couple of times that I tried to approach them, I guess like I assume they are like dogs and they no. got so cranky that um, like they start like scratching me. They, so they I, um, I have some sort of a trauma with that. So that's why <laughs> I don't know, like I, it's getting better. Like now, like my last interactions with cats, like I figured I am doing much better, but yeah. I'm still, you know, a little bit distant. They, they, they are unpredictable. First. They are pretty unpredictable. Yes, so. that, that is true. Um, are you in Vancouver or? In New West, mister. Oh, okay. In New West. Yeah, I, I just know. Just right off the, the key, the key side. I don't know if you're familiar with the area. Um, New Westminster Sky Train Station. The area that had a fire recently? Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, after when that happened, um, you know, like we're in the middle of COVID and we had mm -hmm. the fires from California. So the sky was all hazy. And Never then that fire began. It was, it was really, really like, I was freaking, freaking out. I, I thought that we were going to be evacuated or something because the air was awful. Oh, okay. I can't imagine. I'm going to 6.30 now. I'm going to give it another couple of minutes just All right. if everybody's joining and we you know whoever joins after that, so be it. Fair enough. And how to get my Fernand hand. Fernanda is in, is in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Nice. Hi, Fernanda. I have some international audience. Yeah, that's uh, that's what is incredible about these uh, new ways of connecting. I mean, on one hand, you wish that we were all together in the same room, but at the same time, this opens the possibility of having people from anywhere to join. That's true. Uh, there are some of our meetings that we have people from like five different countries. Right. Yeah. And especially sometimes there are so many things going on that you can't, for some reason, because of distances or timing, you can't attend, right? So this sort of um, sometimes facilitates um, the attendance to these encounters for sure. Yeah. So let's go for it. I think I, I have somebody who sent me a message saying that she's joining, but people as we go. So I, I, uh, I think I know all of you. I'm Lili Vieres Carvalho, Lili is Active Director for the Vancouver Latin American Center. I made this more formal today, put a banner back there. <laughs> nice. and, uh, so you might be somewhere else, but uh, we are zooming in I, from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tisleiwat. We, uh, uh, Vlack has been doing this uh, tertulias. Tertulia is a word that uh, both in Portuguese and in Spanish means 
uh, a conversation pretty much. And so our tertulias have been uh, about several different topics and we have been trying to do them in this kind of living room atmosphere. And so we go, uh, Hyra is going to do his presentation uh, and then we're gonna have some time to, to have a chat. And we are, we are putting it, we put aside at least a half hour for, for a conversation after his presentation. We are super happy to have Jairo joining us tonight. And I, I'm even happier that the, after this tertulia, uh, Jairo is going to be leading a series of talks in 2021, art. So it's going to be this art talks that will be talks about uh, Latin arts in, in different contexts. And it has a pretty cool list of of themes in, in Latin American arts that we are going to be uh, discussing in 2021 monthly, starting in January, right, uh, Jairo? In January. Yeah. And so whoever is not receiving our newsletter, please feel free to leave your email address on the chat and I will make sure to, to add you so you will know when the when the, these talks and other events are, are coming up. Uh, Jairo Salazar, let me just introduce him to you uh, quickly. Uh, Jairo got his master's in art history from the University of North Texas in 2008. He was actually a graphic designer uh, before that, correct, Jairo? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so he went to the, the art history um, uh, way and that was something that uh, enthralled him and, and that's what he has been doing since. His background includes teaching modern, contemporary and Latin American art history courses in Colombia, that's his home country, the United States and, and currently here in Canada. Uh, his academic research is devoted to issues related to the dialogues between war catastrophe and trauma in contemporary art. So he's very, uh, just the right person to talk about art in times of crisis tonight. He cur currently works as an art history instructor at the Coquitlam College and collaborates as a guest lecturer for Mobile Art School in Vancouver, Canada. So welcome you all, so happy to have you all here uh, this evening and I will pass on to, to Hiro. Uh, just a, a, a quick housekeeping, we are recording this meeting and uh, when uh, 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 for most of it, Hiro will be his, doing his presentation so uh, you won't be seeing on the screen. And that's mainly uh, as a record for us for for our funders to to let, let them know that we that we are doing what we promise, and we are um, funded by the of Vancouver, by the the province of British Columbia, and the federal government of, of Canada. Thank you, Hiro. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. I hope we have a great journey ahead. I need to share a screen with you. So I wonder if Lily, can you, can you please allow me? Yeah. There you have it. Perfect. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint. There you go. Can you see the PowerPoint? Excellent. So the title is very simple art in times of crisis. And uh, the title of the presentation came as a meeting that I had a few, few months back with uh, one colleague. And we were wondering what to do as historians, what to do as uh, people engaged or involved in the arts to sort of like negotiate in the midst of this uh, situation. And I realized that in a way, art has uh, served as a tool to cope with trauma for hundreds, if not 
thousands of years. So before we get started, I wanted to, and I, I always, anytime I gave this talk, um, I clarify on this. Um, I don't have the tools. I wish I had the tools to, to give solutions to artists and everybody involved in the arts on how to, um, on how to find a job or on how to be productive during these times. I wish I had answers to that question. And I know that I have here, we have some artists uh, joining tonight. So that might be uh, a topic of discussion for, for later. I just want to look at some examples of the past and particularly of our contemporary times of, um, of, of, of artists who have found a way to, to sort of explore and uh, understand their current realities to transform those realities into visual visual terms. So why am I displaying this image right now? It's a simple representation of the success at hunting, right? So apparently what we see here at the Cueva de Manos in Argentina are some uh, prints of hands. Somebody entered that cave and left a print of his or her hand. Um, I, uh, so it's in a way, it's a representation of the success at hunting. And it's a representation of the belief that if you are able to capture the animal in an image, somehow you are capturing the essence in reality. This is what I did today. I went hunting. I was almost killed by a ball. I ran away and uh, I am still scared, you know? So it's, in a way it's an emasculating and it's an empowering image. It's representing that the animals were perhaps um, controlled by, by the man who was uh, hunting or looking at them. Um, but it's also a means to negotiate with trauma. It's a means for the humans who created that image to negotiate with a trauma. And that's, and what's the trauma? The trauma is I could have been perfectly killed by this animal. And I am leaving a trace. I am leaving a testimony of that experience. And this is from 7,000, 13,000 years ago, pretty much. You recognize this guy probably, Angi Matisse. And probably you, some of you don't know that Angi Matisse underwent an operation for intestinal disorder, later identified as cancer. And despite being bedridden, most of the time after the surgery, Matisse kept going. He decided in 1943 to move 10 miles away from Nice and continue working on his famous cutouts. He couldn't paint anymore. Painting was not an option anymore. So he decided on his wheelchair to start to start creating cutouts from scratch without any prior sketch, without any previous preparation. And this is what he created. Think about it. 1943, he's about in his 50s or 60s. He's bedridden and he keeps creating art. So I'm thinking here 
after looking at this example and looking at the Cueva de Manos, that artists have used art to heal others, but also to heal themselves. And here I am not suggesting that artists are priests or shamans or doctors, but art does have a power. In times of crisis, we try to find ways to release our pain through some sort of didactic or artistic manual activity. This is another example of uh, Jax, the project in 1947, the color paper cutouts created by Angi Matisse. I think that Francisco Goya was the first artist that realized the power of going against the establishment, of rebuilding against the establishment, the, the status quo, if you, if you want to call it that way. And I was wondering when I was preparing this talk, how come that an established artist who worked for the monarchy ended up, we're talking here the same artist working for the monarchy, switched, shifted his artistic style into this type of depictions. The same Goya that portrayed Charles IV and his family is the same Goya that produced the disasters of war around 1812, 1814. Goya understood the need of the artists to separate the creative process from the interests of the market, the interests of the monarchy. So artists were witnesses of reality and denouncers of social injustice as well in the case of Goya particularly. And Goya began to, uh, to find an interest in people, in the commoners, in the victims and not in the victimizers. Those became the subjects of his compositions. In May the 2nd, 2008, there was an insurrection of Spanish rebels who rallied to stop the advance of the Napoleonic troops who were trying to invade Spain. The morning of, uh, you know, so they were trying to overthrow uh, the, the, the French invasion. So the rebels were uh, somehow uh, let me just uh, mirror here a couple of people. Sorry about that. Uh, the rebels were trying to stop the participation, or not the participation, sorry, what am I saying? Uh, the invasion of the Napoleonic troops in France, uh, in Spain. And... Um, Sorry, I just got distracted for a second. I don't know why. I'm just trying to get back to my, uh, my train of thought. If you have some questions or some comments in the meantime, feel free to, to raise your hand or to participate. Okay, let's continue. So I was... Oh, Michelle, you were going to say something? Yeah, actually, I, I did have a quick question. Was Francisco Goya working for, from what I understood, he was uh, working for the royal family? Yep. Yeah. Um, was he still working for the royal family um, as, a, as he was creating those other works of art? Or No. Was, okay, yeah. At the moment he created the disasters of war 
And by the time he decided to create the executions of the 3rd of May, and this is why I wanted to bring up Goya, um, he, rebe- uh, he, he was a rebellious. He turned against the monarchy and was an artist that um, realized that there was a possibility as an artist himself to work on his own terms, to work by his own means without the need of a patron or a commissioner. I was saying that on the morning of May the 3rd, the French troops entered the houses of the rebels, took them out of their homes. The French took the rebels, the Spanish rebels, took them out of their homes and lined them up in retaliation for their previous actions. And what we see here is an overwhelming depiction of the past, the present, and the future. The past, those who have been executed. The present, the eternal present of this civilian who is raising his hands, defying the French troops who are lined up as this repetitive machine that wants, that is, uh, that is uh, anxious to execute him. And the future, those who are behind, lined up to be executed after him. So it's a depiction of time in three moments and the rhythmic repetition of soldiers also is reinforced with the source of light, the light of death, not a light to illuminate purity or to save, to serve as an allegory of beauty and enlightenment. No, that's not a type of light. It's a light of dark. It's a light of uh, that, that it's announcing the darkness that is announcing death as well. In the lower left corner, you see some marks, some damages in the painting right here. Do you notice here? Let me just point it. That damage occurred after the painting was transported in 1937 during the events of the Spanish Civil War. The canvas was severely affected. And talking about the Spanish Civil War, you just move in here, we find Pablo Picasso's Guernica. And it's the same question as what we did with Goya. How could a celebrated artist like Picasso decide it? How does it come that he decided to respond to the atrocities of the Spanish Civil War? Was it his mission? Did he have the need to do that? In January 1937, Pablo Picasso was contacted by the organizers organizers of the International World Fair to be held in Paris that year, from May to November of that same year. So they asked Picasso if he could contribute with a new creation to be featured at the Spanish pavilion. Picasso said yes, but as it happens with many artists, he still didn't know what to do. In April 26, 1937, the Nazi Germans, along with the Spanish Franquistas, bombed, destroyed the city of Guernica. Guernica was a town in the Basque region of Spain who fiercely opposed the far right wing politics of General Francisco Franco. And Franco, in alliance with the Nazi German Luftwaffe's Condor Legion and the fascist Italian Aviazione Legionaria 
allowed the aerial bombing of the town, killing about 70, uh, 7,000 innocent civilians and leaving the town completely destroyed and in flames. After that event, Picasso found the topic for his project. But the people at the International World Fair didn't know that that's what he was planning, that that's what he had in mind. So Picasso decided for the Guernica to depict the atrocities of war, to depict the bullfighting as the spectacle of death. And of course, he's using his cubist style, his celebrated cubist style. So in a way he's bringing cubism out of the studio and bringing it into the everyday. The black and white, the absence of color speaks as symbols of decay and destruction, the lifelessness of modern warfare and the fragmented space, the deformity and the visual revolution represented by cubism that was only um, a movement that functioned in the realm of art acts in the context of the Guernica as a crude instrument to illustrate in this case, not the fragmentation of pictorial space, but the fragmentation of the world. This is a great example on how to bring the theory of an avant-garde movement into the everyday. So when people say, well, you know, uh, this is, um, when people say, you know, this is a, um, a depiction of Picasso and Picasso didn't know how to paint properly because we see the figures here deformed and the figures are not proportionate. And what about this black and white? At this looks like it was made by a child. Well, the deformity, the aesthetic quote unquote ugliness goes along with the issues with the problematics that the artist wants to portray. So the correspondences between Goya and Picasso, that line of time or that timeline, sorry, this message that art or the history of art is the history of the, con the, the continuity and transformation of ideas and expectations is perfectly illustrated here. More so, in 1971, Chris Burden <laughs> realized something that was already in the air around the 1960s. Chris Burden realized that in a saturated, hyper-connected era, artists probably would not be effective if they were still creating works as in the past. So how in a saturated hyper-connected era, how can artists still create works that can cause impact in the 20th century? And what Chris Borden did was um, an artwork that he titled Shoot, a performance in 1971, in November 19, in which he asked an, uh, an attendant, um, an assistant, to shoot him in the arm. In an era um, saturated with television that is bombing us all the time with images in mass media, paintings are too still, and paintings seem like a commonplace. So the reason why many people didn't like Chris Burden is because uh, the performance by Chris Burden sort of caused the same effect in the context of 1971 
that a, a Goya or a Picasso cost in the past. In 1937, Picasso. In 1814, Francisco Goya. So art is the result of the context in which it is produced. And we cannot expect to have artists creating a Michelangelo or a Leonardo in 2020 and wait for the same reactions or the same effects, have the same expectations. You can still paint like Leonardo if you want. But if you really want to cause an impact, you have to create something that corresponds with the times you are currently living in. And that's why I, sorry, that's why I titled this section, uh, Trojan Horses Defying Conventions Through Social Activism. Here we find a convergence of the political and the aesthetic. The aesthetic as an experience liberates our minds and activates our senses. The aesthetic experience engages our senses, but it's not depending upon reasoning. In fact, the aesthetic behavior ceases, stops when we provide scientific explanations to our innermost human pleasures. You know, the unconscious, our desires, dreams and fantasies. The modern aesthetic goes beyond any classical ideas on beauty, class or good taste. The modern aesthetic identifies with the uncanny, with the everyday. So what we see here are basically four different things. First of all, a change of attitude from the artist, a going back to the basics. Let's go back to do something with our hands. That's the very basic definition of art. Um, we also find art as artists as taking position, taking a posture, a gesture, a critical gesture. Artists use art as a political tool in this case. Something we also find slowly, even though this is not the case, is the dematerialization of the artwork and the lack of interest by artists to look as artistic geniuses. So art becomes a participatory experience, a collaborative action, a collective effort. And finally, art serves an educational, pedagogical purpose. So art becomes also an instrument, an educational device to teach others to help others to cope with difficult situations. Now, how can we call the attention of the culture uh, of the consumer society? Well, expressive means can have a wider reach. So artists start looking for the popular, for the mass produced, for cheap materials, for the everyday, for everyday objects that they can take, we arrange, we interpret under their own means. The temporary, the catchy, the flashy, the scandalous, the controversial, the compelling. So some examples of this come with uh, the situationists, right? From in France, graffiti, tag, fan scenes, bombings, billboards, posters, or the famous situationist the, the the tournament or the tournament, the diversion used in, by the situationists in France. A fundamental figure in this uh, way of thinking is uh, Joseph Boyce. Joseph Boyce created a piece titled Coyote, I Like America, 
and America Likes Me. This is from 1968, 1965, uh, 75, sorry. Joseph Boyce understood that the avant-garde was in crisis. Joseph Boyce understood that after pop art and minimalism, there was an exhaustion of conventional means of artistic expression. You know, so this comes after the French May 1968. Artists must be social actors. So the piece, more than a material product commercially valued in the market must be substituted by an action or a statement that can be objectified or turned into a commodity. Everybody's an artist, used to say Joseph Boyce. Everybody's an artist because the act of creation is a human act, despite of anything else. The interests of the art market are not necessarily the same interests. And this is super important. The interests of the art market are not necessarily the same interests in terms of creative processes of the artist at the moment of creation. So the creative process comes here. The market value comes here. Sometimes they merge, sometimes they come together. But the category art with a capital A, to quote Ernst Gombrich, does not necessarily correspond with the very principle and the very basic definition of art. So artists such as Joseph Boyce respond to the expectations, not of the market, but mostly of the public. Symbolic artistic value, I reinforce on this idea, does not necessarily correspond with the market value. And this also corresponds with the convergence of counterculture, art, design, and advertisement. How is art different from design? How is art different from advertisement? What makes these bottles of Coca-Cola by Sildo Meirelles different in any means from the bottles of Coca-Cola that you drink every day. So in 1974, Joseph Boyce spent three days in a room with a coyote. After flying into New York, he was uh, uh, covered in felt and loaded in an ambulance, into an ambulance, then driven to the gallery where the action took place without having once touched American soil. Boyce later explained, uh, I open quote here, I wanted to isolate myself, insulate myself, see nothing of America other than the coyote. And the title is ironic. For Native Americans, the coyote is sacred, represents a powerful god. The coyote, according to ancient tradition, had the power to move between the physical and the spiritual world. But with the arrival of European settlers, it was seen merely as a pest as an enemy, as a threat to the white settlers. So the coyote had to be exterminated. Boyce's action was an attempt to heal some of those historical wounds so rooted in American culture that still we see those consequences today with the racial struggles between whites and blacks, even with, between their own people because of politics. You could say, mentioned voice, that a reckoning had to be made with the coyote and only then can this trauma be lifted, he said, 
end of quote. In 1970, when Sildo Meireles produced the insertions into ideological circuits, Brazil was undergoing the most oppressive period of its 21-year government by military dictatorship. I don't know, I know that we have some uh, audience here from Brazil. I don't know if you would like to comment something about the context in Brazil by 1970. I don't know, I, I open the, the microphone to you if you want to comment something about this. I was a kid, <laughs> but it was, it was pretty bad. Uh, I, I met Sudmir Ellis and I followed his career uh, quite closely. And he has several of these objects that became uh, that he used for like almost ready-made. So of course we see that there are there are uh, that he changed things. Uh, it's it's kind of an instruction to make a, a Molotov cocktail. Uh, so right with the the uh, wick uh, in the and uh, uh, where the the gasoline goes, and then it, so it shows how to make the uh, a cocktail Molotov out, out of that. So it's kind of pretty. Uh, 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 a pretty on the nose uh, uh, thing, but he had a, a sense of humor in his art that I appreciate very much. He's the, right. the guy who did the zero, like the zero real, like the zero Brazilian money, uh, with and uh, that the yep. with the uh, an indigenous uh, figure in the in in, in the money and and actually he distributed that and so you could uh, uh, sometimes find this these bills of, of zero real in, in Brazil. So very very interesting work. The thank you, Lily. Um, the Coca Cola project functions as the perfect example of what I am trying to, um, what I'm trying to share today with you. Because it's an artwork that, as the title suggests, was literally inserted as a Trojan horse into the everyday without uh, I don't know, we will need to read testimonies of back in the day, but apparently many people didn't notice <laughs> that the artwork was circulating in this sort of a pseudo um, subliminal exchange. So Meireles appropriated a symbol of mass production and a consumer culture that responded to the exp in expansionistic purposes and imperialistic demands of the United States, and that's the Coca-Cola, a product that we find every day, that we pay almost nothing for that. I mean, it's pretty cheap, pretty affordable. Anybody can drink a Coca-Cola. So for the Coca-Cola project, Meireles removed Coca-Cola bottles from normal circulation and modified them by adding political statements. Yankees go home, for instance, the one on the left, which is the place of the work of art, the one on the right. Marca registrada de fantasía, right? fantasy trademark, the one on the, on the center. The instructions, as Lily commented, on how to fabricate a Molotov bomb and as the bottle empties, the statements pointed in white become translucent, transparent. The message of the artwork functioned only in so far as the bottles were refilled and returned for their mass produced change of recirculation. Before returning them, of course, to the circuit of consumption and exchange. The artwork is brilliant as a contemporary project and also as a defiance of the tradition of what a work of art stands for. 
The piece is devoid of any traditional interpretation regarding ideas tied to uniqueness. Bottles are mass produced, so the piece is not unique. <laughs> Originality. Coca-Cola is a pre-existing product. Sildo Meireles did not create the shape or the colors or the composition of the Coca-Cola bottle, the color and so on. And that also speaks about the technique. The bottles were not designed by Meireles either. Questions, ideas on authorship. The bottles circulate as commercial soda pop. So the artwork was still circulating as a product. People were drinking the Coca-Cola and returning the bottle to, you know, to, to the retail that will sell the bottle, to the tienda that will sell the, the bottle. And finally, and this is probably the biggest pawn on the institution of art, ownership. It's defined the principle of ownership because nobody could own back then, of course, the bottles. Nowadays, you know, the market, like a sponge, absorbs this type of proposals. So nowadays, the bottles are um, <laughs> exhibited at the Tate Museum in London. But back then, the bottles had no value as they were freely circulating as a consumer product. Oh, I had this written down, but this is in Spanish, of course, but just uh, the importance of Joseph Boyce, you know, so um, it opens the possibility of uh, a change of attitude towards the ways of representing, operating, and acting from the institution of art, the materials, the spaces, the concept of the expanded field, the political attitude, the social and cultural criticism coming from the artist, the dematerialization of the work of art. So work of art can also be an attitude, can also be an idea. And the one that I sort of appreciate the most that art can be an educational tool. And this is what we're doing tonight in a way. We're trying to find answers, to find responses to our conflicted, um, um, unstable times by looking at examples on how artists have coped with uh, painful, um, troublesome situations. And the role of communities and the role of participation becomes critical in contemporary art. The AIDS crisis was beautifully approached by this Cuban artist, Felix Gonzalez Torres, one of my favorite contemporary artists, who by the way, passed away unfortunately of uh, AIDS in the year 1996. This is an example of a participatory artwork because the artwork only functions insofar as the spectators enter, access the space of the gallery and interact with the piece, take or grab with their hands pieces of candy to eat them or simply to collect them for free. The artwork weighed approximately 125 pounds of candy that suggest the actual weight of Ross Laycock, the artist's boyfriend who died, who passed away of AIDS uh, five years before Felix Gonzalez Torres in 1991, I believe. Felix Gonzalez Torres used sweet candy, which is an allegory of love, you know, a chocolate box, uh, bringing ideas of happiness, etc. And the spectators taking a piece of candy became active participants by 
taking away, symbolically speaking, pieces of Wasis' body. In an ironic twist of events, the playful act of grabbing candy from the corner of the installation also suggests that we are acting like the virus, that we are attacking the body of Ross and taking away pieces of Ross's life until there is nothing left. But also there is a message of love intended in the artwork. When spectators grab a piece of Ross, they also grab uh, one of Ross's memories. So Ross's life becomes expanded in the interactions and within their own experiences of those who grabbed pieces of them. Eating the candy is also an act of love in a way uh, spectators are positively engaging with Felix and Ross's love story. They are consummating their love in the act of eating the candy or simply in the dignifying action of collecting the piece to remember uh, the lover's life. And speaking of sweets, this is uh, the artwork of a, of a pretty dear friend who lives in, in, in Texas, in the south of Texas, La Pan Dulce Vida by Angel Cabrales, uh, Mexican-American artist, second, uh, third generation Mexican-American artist from El Paso. The sweet breath life, I am quoting here, Angel, uses Mexican sweet breads, pan dulce, and blends dark satire and puns with the current views of border violence throughout the United States. By involving the audience, the installation brings the issues of border violence and the, enti the enticement of the sweet life at the cost of one's life. Cabrales plays with the misuse of the art verb la instead of el um, in Spanish and showing an intention of the artist in twisting the intricacies of the Spanish language, especially um, when it comes to the intertwined realities faced by immigrants and the challenges faced by immigrants whose way of communicating is by switching constantly from Spanish to English, as we probably do every day, right? We say, buenos dias, how are you, pretty much or the other way around. And that linguistic phenomenon, at least for Spanish speakers, is known as Spanglish. With Cabrales, we cannot detach the presence of the sweet bread with the imagery of a gun. Cabrales' own life experiences come from an apparently opposite world or two opposite worlds, Mexico, and the United States. But they seem to share a commonality. And that commonality is the overwhelming culture and appetite for gun possession that evolves in urban and rural violence. The sweet bread is rooted, and I know we have some people from Mexico here, the sweet bread is rooted in an innermost Mexican tradition, while the use of firearm, firearms has been both a means of defense against and of attack from the enemy. The artist, Cabrales, subtly twists the mass-produced nature of the AR-15s, the 9 millimeters or the mini utsis. So in this case, a pan dulce is neither mass produced nor is its fabrication a task easily replaced, uh, replaced by mass produced um, factories or uh, bakeries. 
In the work of Angel Cabarales, there is no physical weapon, but the sole allusion to a gun, the participants mocking the placement of the bread as if it were a weapon targeting their mouths, makes us wonder whether this collective trauma can still be seen as such, or if we are so used to it that it simply became a sort of a landscape, a background image, you know, a commonplace. The explicit act, however, and this is my intake on the piece, of eating the gun could also be interpreted as a way to cope, to empower, to embrace these traumatic events. That's why we need art, but we also need humor and irony and satire. I understand that we live in, in, in a context that is reconsidering a lot of things about the way we used humor in the past. But at the same time, I wonder, I am afraid about living in a world post-pandemic in which we won't be able to make fun of the pandemic because we have to respond to politically correct expectations. I don't know about you, and I completely respect it, but I am terrified of living in a world in which we can't use humor to overcome our biggest fears. And that's something that Cabrales brilliantly achieves here. The picture of the girl on the right shows the way participants, students from UT, University of Texas at El Paso, engaged with the piece and felt confident by eating the gun, just by not fearing that image anymore, controlling the image like the caveman that we saw on the first image. That, that's why I wanted to make that correlation. And I apologize in advance if the correlation didn't sound too clear at the beginning, but now, I think that we're getting somewhere. Um, throughout history, in fact, art has effectively proved a quote that I love um, by, by a television host and an activist, John Stewart. John Stewart from, uh, I think he had a show back in the days in Comedy Central, I, I forgot. I forgot the, the name of that show, The Late Night with Jon Stewart, something like that. Uh, he cleverly stated once, I open quote, if your regime is not strong enough to handle a joke, then you have no regime. End of quote. In other words, if humor and satire, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, there you go, thank you, Lily. In other words, if humor and satire are a means of teasing and destabilizing the structures of power is because the foundations of those powerful structures, quote unquote, are not solid enough as they proclaim. If Hitler felt threatened by the avant-garde modernist movements, of the first three decades of the 20th century is because he was probably self-conscious. If Brazilian and Argentinian dictatorships in the 1960s and 1970s felt threatened by artists, it's because they were not so sure about what they were doing. These are other examples of Cabrales' works, right? More contemporary from 1913, a playground with wired fences and surveillance cameras, similar scenes, and this is pretty uncanny, were visible during the first weeks of the lockdown due to the current pandemic of uh, COVID-19 with tracking devices for contact tracing, the placement of long and shiny strips of yellow caution tape, warning children and parents not to trespass to playgrounds to avoid contagion with the COVID-19 virus. How will the parks of the future look like? Probably something like what Cabrales 
displayed uh, seven years ago in 2013. In Fire and Fury at the White House, the famous book about the Trump administration, there was a quote that suggested that the most important decisions of the Trump administration were going on at golf courses. <laughs> and this is yet another example of uh, playing with words. This is an artwork produced by Angel Cabrales as well. Title is Hole in One or A Hole in One. So A Hole in One, the golf course sort of a vocabulary, but a hole in one also sounds like, you know, I don't need to say the word. So it's elusive to the US President Donald Trump's decision to host G7 meetings at his golf course. And here the audience feels empowered by taking the role of the lead leader sitting on a chair and they can play around by shooting what seems to be a wooden gun while comfortably sitting on an easy chair. Instead of targeting at birdies or uh, usual greens, participants are invited to target at greens shaped like the country. So we see here Mexico, I believe this is Venezuela or Russia, probably Russia. Venezuela, I believe it's around here. So it's it, it, it turns uh, politics and uh, government decisions into a game. So it's a pun intended at uh, the way Trump um, made politics during his uh, four years in power. The chair as a throne or a pedestal encompasses a symbol of authoritarianism. And chairs and thrones have also worked as allegories of dominance and control. Basically, uh, the principle or the idea is, is that if an emperor can control his horse, he can control all his troops and therefore a whole empire. If a president is sitting uh, in a sort of defiant way in a chair, it means that the chair stands for uh, his uh, gov uh, his government or his uh, the population that he's governing at the moment. Um, I don't know, Lily. We are kind of running out of time, and I don't want to uh, step on the possibility of participating. So I wonder if uh, you want to open room for questions or participation or you want me to keep going with some other examples that I had in hand? Well, I would say if anybody has any questions at this moment, uh, I, I'm fascinated by this last part <laughs> <laughs> because it's true that, it, and so I think we can, uh, maybe what we can do is let's let's chat a little bit. And if you have any any other slides that, that tie in with our conversation, sure. please Shh. go to those. And okay. anybody, feel free to unmute yourselves and, and ask questions if you if you have any. But I I wanted to say that uh, like I, uh, 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 sense of humor is something that I always appreciated in, in visual arts in, in general. And one thing that I, I, I believe it's getting very clear to to everyone and something that has been that I have been thinking a lot lately because when you take away the arts in large part the way that we that we have now like um, everything is a little uh, well or, or quite a bit less accessible than usual it's hard for you to go to to an art gallery or to a museum or to a movie theater or to or to a concert and with Black, we have been experiencing you know, that quite a lot. And so it makes you think, what is the, the role of arts and what is that that we can, can artists contribute in, in those moments? And I think that you are illustrating that quite well because 
artists are always the in on the forefront of of activism and of critical thinking and and I, I'm sure that there is already a lot of really interesting work happening right now about this moment. I, I can't Absolutely. wait to see what is going to, to come out of this crisis in, in terms of, of, of arts. I was yes. on, yeah, 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 about Ai Weiwei and, the, and, and his work that's so tied to, to, to activism and to the situation in China and so many, so many examples, really. I, I, I agree. I, I'm glad that you brought the, the concern, the current concern with the virus to the table because uh, um, the examples that I have coming up next uh, speak a little bit about this and speak a little bit about something that has been a uh, common currency in in the last, at least in the last eight years or 10 years. And it's uh, what they call now cancellation culture or cancel culture and uh, censorship. So I want to talk first about this particular case. I was not in Colombia when this happened. I was already here in Canada. This happened last year in 2019. Um, on October, in 2019, a collective in Bogota, along with an organization of families, victims of false positives, created, created a public mural in, in, a, in a pretty popular, populated area in, in Bogota, in the capital of Colombia, created a public mural denouncing the actions of five members of Colombian military who according to sources, were not only accomplices, but also leaders of the despicable practice of counting the deaths of innocent civilians as positives in war or positives in the battlefield. Falsos positivos. In other words, member uh, civilians disguised as members of guerrilla or paramilitary forces that were supposedly killed in combat. The mural with the faces of those questioned was titled, Who Gave the Order? Quien dio la orden? Alluding to the fact that many of those implicated claimed that they were simply following orders. We can see the stenciled faces of high Colombian military officers and the statistics of people killed under the false positives. But maybe you are thinking, wait a minute, I don't see the statistics. I don't see the numbers. The graffiti led by 11 human rights organizations was censored. So it doesn't exist anymore. The case that they were denouncing, uh, denouncing happened about 14 years ago, but came back again in 2019 after a report published by an investigation posted by the New York Times denouncing a continuation of this practice by the military in order to show successful results to the government in their fight against subversive and mafia groups. The act of censorship stirred so much controversy amongst civilians, um, the public opinion, that the collective, the organization of mothers of sons of victims of false positives, and the 11 organizations for human rights started spreading the render, the digital render of the mural on social media. The image became viral everywhere, worldwide, after a few days, and today is still used in public protests as a live reminder of injustice and civil abuse. The mural 
has been used in television campaigns, social media campaigns, with the hashtag Campaña por la Verdad, T-shirts. Sometimes you see stencils, smaller versions of the stencils on the streets of Bogota. So that's a great example of contemporary detournement, in a way, the deviation. And the message remains alive as a digital copy through social media. And the numbers keep going up, unfortunately. Something similar happened on September um, 2019 as well. Two artists, Colombian artists, Lucas Ospina, artist, activist, and writer, and uh, somebody under the name Power Paola portrayed Donald Trump as a puppeteer manipulating um, a Colombian leader <laughs> who was uh, somebody's puppeteer and was at the same time the puppeteer of somebody else. I am not going to use names. <laughs> the day after the mural was made, the mural was covered in white paint. If this happens, if people react like that, it doesn't matter if people like it or not. It doesn't matter if the argument was, uh, I didn't like this type of art. If there is a reaction, it means that art is still has the power to steer up controversy, to cause a reaction. So art is still is an effective tool to call for social action, to call for attention. The mural was covered in white paint, but then people started repainting it. <laughs> so it became a sort of a palimpsest and uh, this is before COVID, of course, became a place for public gatherings, uh, symposia, um, talks, workshops, classes outside the classroom, collective participations, conversations, uh, even public college classes held on the spot in situ to create this correlation between art, politics, and you know, um, collective action. And the incident created a movement known as classes on the streets or classe a la calle. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this project that is currently going on and has a great history and it's about to end. She's uh, going to wrap up this project once um, President-elect Joseph Biden um, takes, uh, um, takes power. Um, Diana Weimar created this project after a tweet by Donald Trump in 2018. The, uh, the tweet by Trump was, I think that I will qualify as not as smart, but genius. And I am a very stable genius at that. She was so, <laughs> she was so upset by that tweet that she decided to make this as a solid message by using embroidery. She started stitching on a prick. The prick is the, the piece of cloth. And she stitched, stitch by stitch, word by word, Trump's uh, emblematic sentence. I am a very stable genius. The pricks or the prick that she created that time was posted on Instagram. And it got so many reactions that people liking the image 
began to send her messages with their own interpretations of things that were going on on Donald Trump's administration or with the tweets, with the relentless tweets that he was posting all the time regarding everything or anything because Donald Trump speaks about anything. So she decided to create a website and what began as an individual project became a collective, ongoing, massive project. And that's Tiny Pricks Project. So you can participate, you can be part of the project, even though it's going to end soon, because she said that she will only stop once Donald Trump um, ended his period as president of the United States. In a way, I feel that Diana Weimers's intention was to make permanent something that is intended to be impermanent. And that's the advantage, but at the same time, the disadvantage of social media, right? We publish something and the world is so into this frenzied rhythm that as soon as we post something, five minutes later, we forgot about it. We forget about it. We don't care anymore. We don't remember. She thought, I want to remember. I want to create memory. This can't be forgotten. So this is history in the making. By stitching word by word, sentence by sentence, Diana Weimers' project acts as a device of memory, as a reminder of a catastrophic time, and also as a pedagogical tool for future generations in a similar fashion as the Celts that were passed generation after generation. I don't know, at least in Colombia, the Celts are not very common, but I don't know if in other areas of Latin America they are. I'm not sure about Mexico. Embroidery in some cultures is so important that even you could perfectly have a kilt or a colcha filled with different types of stitchings that were going from your great grandma to your grandma and from your grandma to your mom and from your mom to you and from you to your children and your grandchildren and so on. So it becomes like a big material statement of your life, like a diary of your life. Weimers' project, as if it were a diary of horror, reminiscent of the word diaries by Bertolt Breck or Anna Frank, subtly but fiercely states with each prick, subtly but fiercely states, never, never again, never again. Never again. Do you remember that tweet? This Thoughts are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd and so on. I mean, even reading it hurts. But we must remember, <laughs> is what Diana Weimar is saying. We must remember in order not to forget. And we must remember that it's incredible how this uh, act of embroidery um, is teaching making something with your hands is not only speaking about going back to the basics of art making, but it's also sort of like having a revival. There are so many projects nowadays that engage uh, the act of doing something with your hands, literally doing something with your hands. And in times of COVID, 
it achieves even more relevance to do something with your hands because we are overly exposed to screens. I am not going to lie to you, and I know that I am speaking here through a, uh, a screen, but sometimes I have to make pauses or pretend that I am standing up and moving around. Why? Because we are getting way too used to the screens and that is making us less human. So that sort of human contact through the arts is something I believe that has been positive about this current situation. It's making us remember of the importance of <laughs> literally being together, holding hands, staying together. This is not a COVID artwork. This is from 2016, but it's already showing this uh, interesting needlework, this interesting collaborative art. Yes, the artwork is by Doris Salcedo, but the artwork wouldn't have been possible if it weren't by the participation of all these people. Stitching, I insist on this, I stress on this point, is an act of remembrance is also a ritualistic therapy for grieving something, for grieving, in this case, the disappearance or the departure of those who died victims of violence in Colombia. So this was a project that took place in the context of the, the peace agreement with the guerrilla forces FARC, uh, apparently some fraction of the official government wanted to overthrow the, the pact. And Salcedo, as an act of protest, uh, gathered with some students and some other activists and decided to create an act of embroid embroidery that covered Bolivar Square with seven kilometers of fabric. Um, and as an article on Art Nexus comments, I open quote here, this gathering also brought surprises like the one involving Edilma Lopez, who as she walked through the square on her way to buy a candle in the city center, saw the name of her disappeared son written on the fabric that covered the floor. And when she witnessed, when she saw the name of her deceased son as one of the sons, as one of the names, sorry, of the victims that were being, um, that were being honored in this action, this lady, Edilma Lopez, decided to be part of the project. She said, that's the name of my son. And she pointed at the name and she sat down with the other girls and started sobbing because she was stitching the name of her disappeared son. That was an act of grieving, an act of sort of like giving room to the pain of not being able to bury or cremate his own disappeared son. So that was a, a moment of closure for her. She still doesn't know where her son is, but this as a symbolic act of reparation was very important. Cairo. Yeah. We have just a few minutes. Oh my goodness, time flies. Okay, I'm going to stop here. I don't know if you have some questions, comments. Yeah, I would love to know if anybody else has an experience with, with something like that, with art that touched them uh, through a time of crisis. It, I think somebody is raising hand. Yes, just Donna. To yourself, please. Hello. I was very impressed when I heard that you had recently been in Colombia. And mm -hmm. the topic that you're speaking of, I immediately thought of Doris Salcedo. Is it, I'm probably not saying it correctly, but I was really, yeah. I was really happy to see the, this work that I didn't know of that well, 
but um, I've seen other works of hers that just stops you because it's it's very powerful, whatever it is she does. It doesn't have to be this big, but the idea, the concept, the beauty of it is, um, is really powerful. So you have some experience in Colombia. Did you see any of her works? I witnessed yeah, with this piece. Yeah. And uh, it was... Uh, it was criticized because of the process involved in creating it. Apparently, um, some of the volunteers were questioning uh, Salcedo's sort of like communication with them because Salcedo was very strict and was telling them, oh, the stitches need to go like this and not like that, and you are doing it wrong. Awesome. But what fascinates me is that the conversation on the Colombian press was about the process of creation and not about the significance of the piece. Something like what I just told you about this uh, lady, uh, I forgot her name, um, um, Edilma, Edilma Lopez, finding the name of her son and being able to to grieve and to cope with that through participating in the piece. That's what makes the piece valuable. The other conversations about who holds the rights of the official photos and that each photo is worth thousands and thousands. We can leave that conversation for later, but I, I, I was there, I experienced uh, the night when when the project was completed, and I saw everybody involved in the progress in the project, and it was incredible. It was amazing to see people. I even had friends and colleagues involved in the creation of the piece. I didn't participate because I had class that day, but I regret it. I should have canceled class and go and participate. Even if it doesn't matter if you did it wrong, because some people were concerned about. Well, maybe I don't know how to do embroidery properly. Oh, it doesn't matter. People were eager to uh, teach others on how to do needlework. So that was that was very moving. Um, I also in Bogota, I saw a couple more pieces by her. Um, but as you're saying, it doesn't matter the dimensions, um, her artistic process and the quality of what she does, the, the care that she takes into creating these pieces are, are, are amazing. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for participating. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Any questions, comments? Hope you are. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yes, um, uh, so I, I'm from Culiacan, Sinaloa. I don't know if you know the place. I've uh, never been there, but uh, um, I, I've read something about the place. Yeah, of course. So it's a very violent city. Mm -hmm. uh, El Chapo Guzman is a, one of the main drug dealers in Mexico. Mm -hmm. He's from there. So uh, uh, for me, it's interesting how you are speaking about uh, the art in time of, of crisis, right? Because, uh, for example, in Culiacan, it's very interesting. We can see that, uh, that the, for example, there is a big dualism, or I don't know if I am pronouncing the word rightly, but it's dichotomia, dichotomia. Yeah. There is a big, big... Um, uh, two extremes uh, when, for example, in, in, the, in, a kind, in that kind of city, when the government is trying to fight against violence with culture, that is something interesting, right? Because uh, in that kind of environment, uh, the people, the people, they don't, don't have any means to achieve uh, education. Mm. So what, what is very common is that they, they go inside the cartel, cartels, drug cartels. So, and and uh, by the other side, it's interesting, I was hearing you, I was 
just paying some attention to what you were saying. And it's interesting that uh, we know, for example, that they are born, born from bad feelings, right? Right. We have, there is a saying, right, uh, in poetry that art burns from bad feelings. So I don't know, for example, Enrique Lin is one of the main poets in, I think there is, I, I, my memory is not good right now, but it's maybe Enrique Lin is from Chile, I think. And he has a, a, a book that the name of the book is uh, Diario de Muerte. Mm -hmm. So he wrote that book when he was in his last days of life. He was uh, dying from cancer. So it's interesting. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's something that we can see in art. Very, com it's a very common thing to see in art. So it's just that my, my I, thought. Yeah, I I agree with your comment about how something that I probably didn't mention. I, I probably I just got distracted and I forgot to mention that. Um, it seems to me, as art historian, you know, and I'm teaching these college courses all the time. So I am revisiting the canonical history of art all the time. And every time I go back to read about the past, it seems that in times of crisis, when you, you see the foot of somebody pushing you down, creativity flourishes. I'm agree. Um, and I am sure, as Lily was suggesting at the at the beginning of the talk, I am sure that after COVID, so many things are going to come up. They are already coming up. I didn't have the time to talk about this project that is happening in Colombia as well. It's uh, an exchange. So basically, what happened was. Uh, there was a salon going on. This is before COVID, of course. And the salon had to be canceled. So they said, what do we do? You know, like, let's, you know, like any of us, like, what do we do? Let's try to adapt to the situation, blah, blah, blah. So they decided to create something titled Intercambios Artísticos en Época de Pandemia. Um, artistic exchanges in times of pandemics. So instead of making a conventional salon, they asked artists to write instructions to create a work of art at home, engaging or dealing with the pandemic. So for instance, uh, Kinaya Kimir, I don't even know how to pronounce her name. She wrote instructions on how to take some baths at home. You know, or I just selected a few. Uh, El vomitorio de sentires. Uh, what we that we didn't have, we didn't have the 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 courage to say. Uh, performance to cope, uh, a spiritual performance. Uh, that's the way Carmen Sabanguera from Cali defines her project. Uh, so what she wrote here says. I thought that art was going to save me and it's still art hasn't. And here it says, in reality, I wish you will have said something that day, you know? So it's using the domestic space to create something about your actual experience with objects that correspond <laughs> <laughs> to your current realities. And that's, I didn't have the time, unfortunately, but I speak too much. But I wanted to mention about the, the renewed or unexpected importance that domestic spaces have taken in our lives. Right now, I am the only guy using a virtual background. I shouldn't, I don't know why I did it. But we are all sort of like entering somebody else's domestic intimate space and that never ever happened i believe in in the recent history of humankind unless i was very familiar with lily or with dona or with jobian i hope i pronounce your name right or with michelle you will never experience the inside of somebody else's apartment right that's intimate 
but now we see cats flying and we see people sitting on couches and we even see stars in television presenting their you know their 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 shows from from their couches or from their living rooms so that has created a new aesthetic that is you know sort of like making us reconsider about our relations with the interior, but also with the exterior and about who we are outside. Because I, I also wonder, who are we going to be like when we go back to socializing? Will we be worrying that much about having our hairs combed and, you know, like having our shirts talked and all that? Because maybe we're getting used to just being cool, being comfortable with ourselves. And I think that's probably positive. Maybe it's negative. We don't know. It's just still too soon. But these type of projects are the result of those uncertainties. I'm pretty sure we will have another opportunity to discuss these projects or the project of my friends at uh, Mobile Art who designed a game that you can download on your tablet and you can play in your tablet by creating doodles and you submit them and randomly what you submit is organized with the with the works of other people and these uh, sort of like drawings are created uh, in a sort of a exquisite corpse type of technique similar to the surrealists you know so there are things going on there are things happening and there will be more things happening soon. Sorry, I just extended on yeah. the last uh, comment. If you mark, and I, uh, uh, this is our official time to <laughs> wrap up. Uh, uh, I just want to thank everybody who, who was here tonight. This was fascinating. Hi, oh, thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Uh, I just want to keep chatting because it's just so uh, not only we're saying how it, uh, the importance of artists in, in times of crisis and, and that they are in the forefront of activism and, and, and bringing innovation, but we also know that now that we are uh, all home, we are relying, you know, in movies on Netflix and, and listening to music and, and, and reading books. And so there is a space for, for for the creative realm and to you know to 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 catch up uh, with the artists in a way some arts are more affected than the others i would say that performing arts for sure are, are having a hard time right now to try to adapt but it's really amazing the things that we are seeing people come up with and other ways of presenting work and so many things that we thought that were impossible and and that that now are and so with that, let's let's say good evening and, and thank you again so very much for joining us tonight. Uh, we, I believe you are all on our newsletter. If you are not, please uh, either email me or leave your your email address on the chat, and I'll make sure to 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 catch you up. We have a concert, a, a Christmas concert coming up this weekend. So just look at that on our website and it's going to be with Miguelito Valdez and uh, with his family. So that's one of those situations. He's, his bubble, it's him, his wife and, and kids. And, and all four are going to be in this concert on Sunday and to just go to, to Black. I'm going to put our website here. And, and or to our Facebook page because it's actually going to be live on, on, on Facebook. Hiro, thank you. Really looking forward to more of this in the in the new year, and I hope to see you all again in one of our other tertulias or the the upcoming art talks. The thank you goes to all of you. I apologize, I didn't have the time to cover everything I wanted, but sometimes I just let myself go with. I just wanted to leave you with. The reason why I have this painting in the background, it's an Edward Hopper painting. And I hope, I'm pretty sure that 2021 will be the year where we will open the door 
and we will have the sea right next to us and we can finally go out and enjoy the summer. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.